Good afternoon. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us, Art Basel Miami Beach Conversations. We're ex exceptionally excited about this conversation, our art market talk called What Art Problems, Which Art Problems Can Blockchain Solve? Um, our moderator today is Orit Gott, who's a writer based in New York and London. Um, she's going to introduce the speakers. Thank you all very much for speaking with us today and help uh, welcome all the speakers with a nice warm round of applause. Hi, thanks for coming. Um, so I am here with Ruth Catlow, who's a curator and an artist and a founder of Furtherfield, an organization in London, um, Matt Hall, who's a developer and an artist, and Harm van den Dorpel, who's an artist. Um, I'm not going to give you the biographies because no one needs to do that anymore. Um, and I'm going to start by trying to provide like a working definition of what blockchain is. Like we can all try and define it and fail at it together later. Um, but I'm going to just veer on the side of let's have like a second about this before we delve in. Also because I wrote it and it feels like a waste not to use it. <laughs> Um, so blockchain is essentially an open distributed ledger used to record transactions in a verifiable way. Blockchain was originally devised as a system to support digital currency, specifically Bitcoin. Introduced in 2008, it has many more uses than just for cryptocurrency. The blockchain is essentially a register, like a log of actions, that is shared across countless nodes or computers, a database that is constantly updated. Every record is added to a block of records and is timestamped, and all are constantly reconciled. Once a record has been added, it can't be altered. The blockchain is decentralized and spread across all the points in the network, meaning there is no single point in which information is kept, which means it's both safe and can be verified. Um, I'm assuming a lot of you have heard about blockchain mainly in relation to speculation about cryptocurrency, especially when Bitcoin rose by like 150% and then dropped by 300% and then rose again. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that, but we're mainly going to talk about other uses of blockchain, like the fact that it's used to claim and organize intellectual property and copyright and licensing, especially around music and how we can do that with art, to organize voting, to support digital markets that are both illicit and legitimate. And, and basically, like the idea of this panel is that this is a structure that's being built right now and that we all want to make an argument that artists have something to say about it or a way of participating in it. Um, we'll talk for like 45 minutes between ourselves and then open it to questions. Um, first question could be, what is the blockchain? Again, but that's totally up to you. Um, but I'm going to start by asking the panelists basically to introduce themselves through like what concerns they have or like what kind of interest or engagement you have specifically with blockchain. Um, do you want to start, Ruth? Yeah. Um, so, Furtherfield. So I'm an artist and uh, founder of Furtherfield, and we grew up with the web. So we started in the mid '90s uh, with the gut feeling that what we needed to do as artists was to build our own context. So we kind of, as, as some kind of resistance to the Saatchi scene in London. And uh, the web was just growing up and we connected with artists, techies and activists and built the platforms that we needed and understood that those platforms allowed us to form the kinds of social relations that we wanted to form in order to collaborate and we, it was we grew up alongside the free and open source software movement. So that was the kind of ethos that we were working in. Um, uh, I describe myself as a recovering web utopian. I really bought the kind of decentralized Kool-Aid and imagined uh, an anarchist utopia flowering. Uh, and of course, what happened was that we saw with networked effects, the mass kind of uh, Recentralization of the web in the mid noughties um, so our our we've, we, we're coming to the blockchain with curiosity i'm utterly fascinated with the ability of the blockchain culture to hold the full range of political complexions in thrall, like everybody thinks it's something that they can do something with, and everybody of all complexions also hates it. 
Uh, so this is fascinating as a cultural phenomenon. And, but the thing that right from the start was the thing that we've been looking at and trying to work out how we can do something with is the kind of bringing the governance mechanisms to focus on community. So back in 15, 2015, we launched a program called Art Data Money. So Furtherfield's been uh, publicly funded at quite a kind of uh, humble level, let's say. We run a gallery in the heart of a park in North London where 180 different languages are spoken. So it's a very particular kind of culture that has both a local presence and an international presence. And so the Art Data Money program was, it set itself the task to build a commons for the arts in the networked age. And then we've done lots of things. So we put out a provocation and our, our tactic is generally kind of from the, it's a kind of tactical media tactic. So you put out a really strong, a call with a strong ambition and attract people who, with the technical and intellectual skills to either pull it apart tell you what's wrong with it or help you build it. So I'll finish up by saying we're, I think we've kind of come up with a formulation that we're going to explore called Culture Stake. And this is a project that enables us to distribute votes to all, uh, anyone who has ever contributed anything to Furtherfield in uh, proportion to what their contribution has been. Obviously that is going to be a piece of work. But this is artists, writers, visitors, readers, and then we're implementing, we're doing some experiments with quadratic voting, which allows people to express both preference and intensity of preference, and invite people to get involved with the governance of our organisation, which means having those critical conversations with us about how we want to be funded, as well as what our programmes might look like, who we might work with, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and it's solving, or, yeah, I, I love that we're solving problems on this panel. The problem that it's solved, there's kind of two very pragmatic things that we're looking at. One is uh, the problem of living in a global society, but, so having this kind of international network of artists, but being in a local place. Uh, the relationship between international and local artistic communities is really fraught on many grounds, and I think this gives us a way to have more information about how people can see themselves in relation to each other. And the other is the generational thing. We've been around for 20 years. Generations proliferate about every two years on the internet. So we've got these multiple generations of uh, contributors who don't see themselves together very often. And that's one of the things we're trying to solve. Thanks. Matt, can you talk about your work with blockchain and the sure. art? Um, so uh, I came to the blockchain as from a technical side of things uh, as a developer. And for me, it was just kind of, it feels like, I mean, and blockchain now we're, you know, 10 years into it or so, and it's like this weird cultural thing, and there's really strong opinions about it because of the people involved in it. But when I first encountered it, it was like this little miracle where people started valuing uh, data on their computer. Like I had a thing on my, just on my hard drive that was worth money. And that was like, I'd never really seen that before. It was like a technical thing that had allowed this psychological and cultural thing to happen. So it was really interesting, but we couldn't really figure out what to do with it. I'm speaking we, me and my partner, John, who I do all this stuff with. Um, but then we kind of thought maybe this could be, you know, you think you have a piece of money on your computer, maybe you could have a piece of art on your computer. And would people feel like they owned it if it just said on this sort of global database, this blockchain, if it said you own it, do you feel like you own it? Like, do you want to buy it? Do you want to sell it? Like, it, it was kind of a miracle that, that the blockchain allowed money to function. Could it also allow, like, ownership of something else? So we made this project called the CryptoPunks, which is 10,000 unique characters, and you can... You, we gave them away for free at the start, and then you started, there's a marketplace built into this thing. We don't control it anymore. It runs on the blockchain. You, you could put money into it. Things have sold for a lot of money. We don't ever hold the money. It's this super miraculous, trustless thing. And it kind of worked. Like People felt like suddenly they were owning these things, even though the pictures of these characters were everywhere. So it felt like a solution, perhaps, to the ownership of digital art 
where versus like there's weird stuff where you right now where you have like a DVD in the basement of a gallery or something and you you say like okay I own that great no one else can have it this was like the art is everywhere but only some people own it and this miraculous database this blockchain says who owns it so that's been the first thing we've done with it and it's just kind of turned into this interesting it's about a year and a half old now and it has all these weird interesting properties that we can talk about but um, but that's how I got into it. And Harm, can you tell us about Left Gallery too? Yeah, sure. Uh, I, I run an online gallery, an uh, online digital art gallery, uh, which I founded with Paloma Rodriguez Carrington, who is not here. And I am a digital artist. I also make many works in spaces, like op uh, physical objects. But um, it was always sort of unclear how to find ways to distribute digital art. I mean, there, is, there are systems already available, of course. Um, what I noticed was that people have a particular hesitation to pay online for immaterial things. Like, if, if people go to a bar, they think one second if they want to buy a beer. If they want to buy an app for their phone, they're like five times thinking, like, do I really want to spend two euro or two dollar on this app? So there's a strange hesitation there. And um, I thought, how could we overcome this? So, for example, on the iTunes st store, when people by music, it's actually pretty unclear if they don't download that music, if they actually own that music. Like, what happens to that music when Apple would disappear? That's not going to happen pretty quickly. But uh, there was this moment where Amazon um, revoked the rights of a particular book on the Kindle, and suddenly the, the book disappeared on the Kindle of these people, which was surprisingly uh, 1980. Uh, what's the book by George Orwell? 1984, 1984 which is pretty funny. And so I devised a, a system using quite similar technology as you um, of, to tokenize editions of artworks um, using this particular standard ERC721, which many people use now, and using this kind of magical piece of technology that is just available, you can impose an artificial limit or an edition or a scarcity. And that was pretty mind-blowing as I was also, like Ruth, kind of uh, disappointed with the internet. And this seemed to be just just exciting. I don't know where the future will take it and to what extent it will explode or implode, uh, I don't know. But just for left gallery, it kind of works. Left.gallery, totally plugging my own thing here. Thank you. And yes. Um, I'm going to start my next question with like starting by the thing I hate the most on every panel, which is every time you go and listen to a panel, the moderator says, well, we were all hanging out before the panel and talking before all of you guys heard us. We all said so-and-so, so I'm going to do that. We're all in the back room there, and we're talking about how on every panel on blockchain or in every crypto event could be really different. So, like There are people there, like there'll be one crypto event that's all bankers, and they all think that blockchain is great. And there'll be another one that's all like radical anarchists and they all think it's great. Um, and it seems like here there are like three positions that are quite different about the idea of ownership, which I'm quite interested in. Like, I want to ask you if, so like both Matt and Harm, you talk about like having a different sense of ownership, right? Um, but then your idea of voting voting rights on further fields activities is also an idea of ownership, right? Of a stake. And I want to ask if, like, do you think it's the actual technology that, like, could affect the way we think about what ownership is? Like, is your relationship to digital art different because you have a stake in it? Is your relationship to an organization different because you have a stake in it? I'll go first. It's go a nice first. question. Um, one of the things that really fascinated me about this space and, and, and has a sense of, it has a bit of a frisson to it, is that the web allows people to do things without accounting for anything they're doing. So you can just, you know, I can send a gajillion, I can send a file to a gajillion people and it doesn't cost me anything to do that. And there's something about the record, the accounting and the record keeping uh, that is associated with the blockchain, the way blockchain makes you think about stuff, that I think, I don't know if that's attached to ownership, but it's that kind of, it's this sense of accounting. It's something that I'm, I'm kind of, I, I, I thought I would be against it, but I actually think it's quite an interesting thing because it's somehow a, 
it's, it's also a call, a call to account. It gives you both sides of it. So that isn't an answer to your question. It's an answer to another question. <laughs> yeah, and the other question I'm like, I had it last night with people. I was like, how do we think of blockchain as like a metaphor too? Like, how do we think of it abstractly as something that changes the way we relate to the world around us, specifically to art, I guess? So like, that might be the answer to that question. <laughs> but you guys really should talk about ownership because it's maybe more related to... Um, yeah, I found that people do feel differently about it. Like there's... Um, I mean, it was when Bitcoin came out, which is now, I think we're just over 10 years ago that happened. Um, it was, it was seemed dumb. Like it seemed like a super dumb idea. And people, you know, it was only the nerdiest of nerds were into it. And there was a pizza got bought for 10,000 Bitcoin. And everyone was like, this is a joke. Mm -hmm. And, um, but even just that, pit, that pizza getting bought, that was like, oh, it's worth something though, right? Like it's not worth nothing. And then at the same time, everyone has seen this rise happening together and they all own it and it's open source software is involved. So there's this sense of ownership over not just the coins that I hold, but also the direction of the whole thing. We felt that too with our project. People feel like if they own a number of these characters, um, then they feel like they want to have a say in what we're going to do with these things. And, and, and in some sense, we're just participants as well now because we don't control the code anymore. It's like sort of... Uh, installed forever on the blockchain. We can't change anything. So we're like, we have our ideas too, but we can only direct things so much. So it is, there's a, it changes a number of things about the relationship with digital things, I think. Like you're used to them being infinitely copyable, which is sort of still the case, except that now they're scarce in ways which we were talking about. So there, it, it, I find it, I find it interesting. I do find it to be a little different. It just changed my relationship with digital things, I would say. Yeah, I think we are all already really familiar with a, with a, a similar system of artificial scarcity, which is the, the domain names, you know, which you, www, actually www is not part of the domain name, but, and some domain names sell for a lot. And there is somewhere, some, some, some organization that decides wh who gets which one, and it's pretty shady. And this seems to be slightly better. And... What of, often people confuse the, div, the um, ownership with accessibility, because I come from a net art background, and when I tell people that there is a limited amount of editions of a particular work, they, they say that's elitist, el elitist, and like, but they, they confuse the fact that actually that work could be accessible for everybody. Uh, you cannot impose uh, copyright. Uh, I'm no, um, the possibility to copy files. Files will be copied. There's no DRM. It's just who owns which particular one is the thing that is being stored. Can I just add to that? Because I think there's also this relationship between uh, ownership of a digital file, but there's also the status of a digital file. There's a, there's a work by Rob Myers called uh, Is Art, and it sits on the Ethereum blockchain, and you can toggle on and off by paying it Ethereum, and you can say, Is Art, I've paid a fraction of Ethereum, this is now art toggle off, it's no longer art. So you're making art every time you... And there's something... and, and uh, it's. I think there's really a lot of interesting uh, kind of reflection uh, in if we think back to the kind of... If we apply some of the thinking that was applied in 70s conceptual art about the relationship between art and capital and commodity. And I think that that, that stuff's all happening in this space as well, which is really interesting. Which is interesting because that stuff didn't really happen with net art in the 90s, right? You both talk about being from a net art background. Um, and I think that more contemporary digital art um, after net art, whatever terminology we would use for that, um, seems to have a really different relationship to the market. And um, do you think that like blockchain can grow digital art, can grow it both its market but also its institutions? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah I think yeah. it could be. Yeah. yeah. So Seems what promising. problems yeah, can the blockchain so. solve? Is <laughs> that would be a sad time to say, nope, nope, <laughs> not gonna work. Wrap it up. Yeah. Um, I'd be fine with that. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's talk about access then. It's like there's definitely the question of like you feed it a tiny bit of Ethereum, but to get to the point of owning Ethereum um, takes a little while and a little like acquainting yourself. And I mean, 
do you define the characters as something that like basically like, gets people like like collectibles that like gets people access to like their first ownership of something on blockchain? Um, yeah, I guess there's a couple things there. It is still like a bit of a pain to do the whole thing. There's lots of like user experience problems with this, and it's still like you know we're used to talking about it now a little bit, but it really is still an early adopter thing, um, and. Um, I guess the, uh, the answer to the, the sort of the collectible versus whatever is that, yeah, we tried to build in some of this stuff, like collectible aspect, because we wanted to, to appeal to the audience of people who already knew how to use all this stuff, right? Like it was too much to ask for someone to come in off the internet, figure out what is the blockchain, let me get some of this, you know, ether you're talking about, let me get a wallet, let me get, like, it's just not gonna happen. They'd look at the page and be like, yeah, cool, like I'm done. So yes, there was an audience there we had to appeal to, so we, we built in some of those aspects, thinking like reasons for people to get into it, we also wanted to have some of those market forces too, um, where people get into, there's some very rare um, thing, parts like aspects to it, and you can pay more for those if you think they're worth more. So we wanted all that to be in there too, yeah. Can I, um, in left gallery, we, from the start, we figured like the, the majority of the people is not gonna understand what it, what, what the cryptographic element of it is. But so the, the payment is, you can use cryptocurrencies, but you don't have to. And then if you buy a work and you want to own it, but you don't know what a wallet is or what a token is, you don't have to have one in order to own it. So we hold on to the tokens for the people. So then there's still uh, uh, this idea of trust still. And so we're trying like layers of decentralized, decentralized tech, yeah. Have you seen people who like you like banked tokens for then try and participate more and buy crypto to like, have you seen people change their attitude because they bought some art on left field? Some art, that thing, art. I think there's not that many applications of token systems. And so people are quite happy that they, they have had this wallet, but it was always empty. And now they have a token in their wallet. Mm -hmm. And they have a left gallery work and they will have a crypto kitty. And they're, so it feels like finally it's happening because so much is speculative in this space. It might also be that you have to have already gone through like the psychological transformation to owning, feeling like you own something when you have cryptocurrency. Maybe that's part of it. You've made the leap and you're like, I have money, even though it's like this weird, you know, string of digits on my phone. So now I understand that I have art in, in the same way. It's like, it's a bit much to ask to make those two leaps at the same time, I think still. Well, it's funny, I think like I like stick to like some educational thing about like art's involvement with the blockchain. Like how do people learn more about it through art when actually like, you know, that leap was made with conceptual art. As you talk, like there's a history to how we think about this and it didn't need like a didactic, like, oh, there's like the one essay about how we think about conceptual art. I think I'm like, lingering on the like didactic a bit too much, being like, how do people understand this? Because it's hard. I, I was at a conference on Tuesday where uh, Amy Whitaker quoted Heidegger. So I'm going to quote, I'm going to misquote Amy Whitaker. Quoting Heidegger. Uh, quoting, quoting Heidegger. And she basically was, her, the definition of art that she was channeling from Heidegger was that it's a thing that brings the world into existence around it that needs to exist. So you make the work before the world is ready for it, and it kind of pulls the, the world into existence. So we could think of it in that way. God, it's so funny, I had the same conversation in a taxi coming into Basel, <laughs> being like, let me like tell you about Arthur Danto on Warhol, and how like <laughs> it requires an art world in order to understand yeah. <laughs> that it is art. Um, let's stick to that and talk about like the utopian streak of Arthur Danto, and it requires an art world in order for all of us to come together and agree that in 1964... I didn't say an art world, I just said a yeah, yeah. world. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Arthur Danto refers yeah, yeah. to it as okay. an art world. Um, <laughs> But let's stick to that and like talk about a little bit about like the utopian streak that people have when they discuss old technology and blockchain technology specifically. Like people think that like it will change our financial system and we won't need like Bank of America anymore and that it will change democracy, which is actually something I've learned about from you and then was Googling like crazy, like what voting could have, like what could happen to voting on the blockchain. Like, do you feel optimistic? Like, and do you feel like art could lead that way at all? Um, recovering web utopian says, yes. uh, there, it, like optimism, pessimism, I can't, I just don't know. 
um, it's a really fascinating, it's a fascinating field that we pay, that we just have to pay attention to. So I think uh, coming off the fence, I think what I, my, my main feeling is that this stuff is happening and the world is forming under our feet and we need many more people to be paying attention to in whose interest that's happening, how it's happening, how it's going to change, how it's going to change their worlds. So, yeah, I don't know. Can you play an optimist or pessimist role for me? Yeah, I find that I'm like, sort of, I end up being on the other side of whatever person I'm talking to because I, this happens with all technology. We overshoot, right? We get, we get the people saying it's going to be everything and it's amazing and it's about to be amazing. And we're actually like a few years away from it being amazing. But it's, so it's not helpful to overshoot because then we go too far the other way where it sucks and it's useless and it was never any good. And we're seeing that with um, cryptocurrency. With Weirdly, we have this price to talk about, which we didn't have with like the internet and things that came before that. We couldn't say like the internet sucks because it's only worth $92. Like that doesn't mean we didn't do that before. So I feel like we overshot. Now we're probably about to undershoot. Maybe we already are. Although there was the kind of the, the web bubble. Well, that's true. Yeah, of course. I yeah. think it's really comparable. Yeah. I think that kind of really early days web and where we are yeah, now. Yeah, that's true. The internet bubble. Yeah, yeah. good point. Yeah. Um, and also, I think then we came out of that. It was like when everyone said the internet was stupid was when we were all like sending un, you know, emails and starting to use Amazon every day and doing all this Googling. And it was like, yeah, you're saying it's dumb, but you're also using it all day long. So I think that's also part of it is like if it solves a problem and it's useful, then it will become something that we all end up using. If it's just a, a, a method of speculation, then no, like that's not a very interesting thing. And it, it probably is money. Like it probably is super useful as, as money. Will it be more than that? I think so, but, um, but I think we're a little ahead here. Like it's not totally obvious that that's the case yet, but I think it will be. I, I really, sorry, Harm, I'll shut up in a minute, but I really, in a way, I think it's been really useful that it's done this kind of, the hype around it being the democratization of money or the democratization of investment, because I think, I think we're seeing the, the kind of, ridiculous hype play out in public in a way that is helping people's literacy around money and finance to kind of, I think, I think that's actually quite interesting and useful. It's a, it's a side that's effect. That's like the nicest possible way to put what yeah, is happening here. When I ever, no, whenever yeah, I hear like democratizing yeah. anything, yeah. I just run it's, out the door. Yeah, like being robbed on the street and being like, what a wonderful education <laughs> on public safety. Fair enough. In safety. Um, Harm, how do you feel now? <laughs> um, I like to compare it with the drum computers by Roland that was, were made in the 70s, early 80s, that those drum computers were made to replace the drummer in the band. And the drummers hated them, not because they would be replaced, but they sounded really bad. They didn't sound like it. And so these things were put on the market for low prices, and from that, techno and hip-hop came. And I feel we don't know, what, we don't know where it's going to go. And I'm an artist, I like to engage with technology because it inspires me and I chew on it and I see what I can do with it. And I, I don't make that judgment if it's good technology or bad technology. I'm, I'm, I'm just figuring it out and after a while I might spit it out again. And yeah. Let's build on that then and be like, let's, to imagine what could be done, let's talk about the things that we've already seen done that are interesting to us. Like, can you tell me about like one of your favorite projects on Left Gallery or like one of your favorite projects of like artists using the blockchain for anything but like just authentication or like IP management? Of course I like all the works in Left Gallery. <laughs> but I must say that the oh, works in Left Gallery, them, the works themselves, do not engage with, with cryptocurrency or, or crypto, cryptographical technology. In that sense, we're really old-fashioned. And I also think that I am not necessarily interested in art about <laughs> cryptocurrencies. I'm kind of generally interested in art. And this is more of a, a mechanism to redistribute that. And so that's kind of a, not a real answer. But. Wait, but it seems crazy to me that you think that the context through which it is distributed and sold doesn't affect it at all. It's like seeing that, like seeing a painting at Art Basel doesn't change the fact that it's like exactly the same as seeing it anywhere else. I, I, yeah, I'm completely opposite to you. I'm completely fascinated with protocological works, mm -hmm. works that go like deep into the medium and do things that only that medium can do. And for me, the kind of uh, 
the exemplar of that work, that kind of work is happening with Terra Zero, and they're, they're putting a forest on the blockchain to come to own itself. Can you explain that? Yes. Um, so they've been doing, they, they're basically doing work to tokenize natural resources and then form companies for those natural resources to hire humans to service them in order that they can become healthier and uh, become and expand their value and wealth. Uh, it's extremely creepy and a really good way of thinking through, in my view, what happens when we financialize living things and that the relationship between those things. And they've, they're, they're now doing very slow work. They're kind of working their way through different elements of the blockchain protocol in order to basically kind of open it up and show what this might mean to future societies. And this is really good work for me. And so I'm also deeply fascinated by art, art that engages directly with blockchain as the, sort of the subject or the substrate of the work. But at the same time, I'm also very interested in art that deals with artificial intelligence or art that deals with genetics. So I also want to find ways to offer this work. So I, 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 I do think it's possible to disconnect the, the means of distribution, which is using crypto, uh, cryptocurrencies or cryptography with the content of the work. Because if we only use crypto for work that is about crypto, I think we'll get bored with it pretty soon, yeah. Yeah, I would, I would agree that there can be a separation there and there's, it's, a, it's a tool, so it can be simply like, like the internet, it's a way to watch a, a video, it's a way to watch a movie, great, or, but the internet allowed new ways for people to interact with each other, it allowed, like it made practical new ways of doing things, and the blockchain I think is the same, so there's, um, and it ha does have generally tend to involve like financial aspects uh, just because that's where it comes from, I guess, and that's what it's good at. But so that's also what I'm most interested in right now are works that are kind of working with that aspect of it, the monetary aspect and also the sort of democratic aspect of it. So an example of a new one is called um, 89 Seconds, which is uh, Eve Sussman and Snark Art. They've taken the artist proof of, um, of one of her works and they've atomized it. They split it up into pieces and they're selling it to people and then they're gonna destroy the, the final artist proof. And so if that work wants to be shown in a, in a gallery again, you need to go and ask permission from all the people who own the little squares and then everyone who says okay, then they'll play the video with those squares and the ones that are missing are just black. And so now she, she's gone through this process where she's giving up control over her work to these people and hoping that they'll allow her to show it again. And it's, and it's kind of, it's, I find that part really to be interesting. It's like involved in like a really fundamental way to the, to the idea. So it doesn't have to be that, like you said. I, I totally agree with that, but I, I, those are the things that are interesting to me. I, I guess I would, I would think about what that work's doing slightly differently in that she's not giving up control of the work. She's just setting the frame outside of just what the first image looks like. And she's making it into a social, it's a, so, it's a piece of social art in a way. It becomes a portrait of the community of collectors. And th that's really interesting. I really like that, yeah. yeah. And it also builds an aesthetic system yeah. that reflects the thing, which yeah. is actually quite amazing. Like one of the things I wonder about a lot about digital art is like whether or not like the only political possibility for it is to like show something that is hidden because so many of the like financial and technical structures behind specifically the internet are invisible and they're very like resolutely invisible. Like we use words like the cloud and openness to disguise power relations. And you see a lot of artists that like pretty much like their entire body of work is to count that by using visual work to like give an image to the invisible and that sounds a lot like this is like one of the possibilities of art like that deals with blockchain that has to be on the blockchain in order to reflect that system to give it an image to be to like make an aesthetic that could only be that yeah and when we were uh, when we were talking about it like the project that we have with the 10,000 characters there's just some practical concerns that are sort of affecting the project as it, as it ages. So it's a year and a half old now, and some number of people have just straight up lost the password to their account. 
So, <laughs> so those, and it's not like it's not like forgot password at your at your bank or you know at Facebook or whatever. You can't just go get another one. Like it's done. Like so that's those some portion of those characters are lost now forever. Not lost visually. You can see them. So, but ownership is gone in a weird way. So they're going to probably experience a similar thing with this 89 seconds project where like oopsie daisy like last <laughs> last my thing and now now there's a black piece in the middle of the video forever <laughs> so th so then it becomes a portrait of incompetence which <laughs> yeah, is quite right. cool yeah. Yeah. well it's also a portrait of the fact that like isn't like 60% of bitcoin forever gone by people who like bought bitcoin early on and lost their key yeah we have something like Fifty thousand pounds worth of Bitcoin sitting in landfill somewhere. Yeah. We were really early. We didn't understand what we were doing. <laughs> Threw the computer away. What a shame! God, there's so many <laughs> legends about this. It's a great technology. You know what we should do is like we should own art with this. That sounds great. We can lose stuff permanently. I mean, everybody wants really ephemeral art, right? <laughs> um, let me ask you one last question. It was like go back to the title of the panel and be like, which problems can the blockchain solve? Because, I mean, to me, I saw the title of the panel and I was like, which problems? Okay, well, intellectual property, authentication, and something that would replace a certificate of authenticity. Um, do you, are there other problems that you think could be solved on blockchain beyond, is it really just like a pretty much a database to like organize monetary structure or like value? either intellectual value or financial value? I feel like you have an answer to that, right? I just, I just like, think, like, those things are huge. It's not a, is it just that? I'm in the business of huge questions. <laughs> no, no, I mean, the things that it can do are really very impactful things because they enable uh, potentially the automation of a kind of coordinating process of capital and all kinds of transactions and for those things to happen transparently or not. I mean, whether the techno whether or when the technology will get there is the question and kind of in relation to everything else that's going on in the world and who pushes the technology forward and does it all happen actually on private blockchains rather than public blockchains. So these are all kind of... Yeah, that's yeah. something we haven't discussed when we talked about aesthetics too, transparency. Like, yeah. how transparent are your projects? Um, ours is, I would, I would argue, perfectly transparent. Like we, you can, you go usually you go to our website to buy and sell them, but you don't have to. The the code that um, that sort of governs the buying and selling these things is open source, and it's not just open source. It's like embedded in this blockchain. We can't change it. You can verify that's what's there. We can't change it. You can verify that we can't change it. Someone else ha can and has made other websites where you can go and buy and sell the stuff that we made. So it's. You know, and so as a result of that, people trust it with money, whereas they wouldn't necessarily trust us with money. So there's a bunch of interesting stuff there that it kind it only can do, kind of. Um, and it's also pretty cheap. Like people buy and sell things that are pretty expensive for about ten cents in transaction fees. That's pretty amazing. And I can I can buy and sell it with you or anyone here, and not have to involve a lawyer, not have to you know get insurance for it or whatever. It just happens automatically. So yeah, don't lose your password. But like, but other than that, there's all these other wonderful things that it can do, which I think are are pretty huge. Uh, I think even it's too transparent. Um, when when somebody buys a work on Left Gallery and they they receive the token, then their wallet address is exposed and you can go into the wallet and you can oh this person owns quite a lot of ether you can just see how much i mean they could set it up differently like having different wallets but many people don't do it it's also fun because you can see what other things they have but and but oh this person spent like five thousand uh, dollar last week oh interesting uh, so so we need solutions for this it's too it's too open yeah okay i think it might be time to open it to questions oh wow there's so many questions <laughs> I heard a lot about democratization, uh, digital ownership. I wonder if you know of any project that is working towards democ democratizing ownership of actual physical art and doing so with blockchain. So imagine all of us here, we cannot afford a Da Vinci, but we could all own a little piece of that Da Vinci through tokens. Do you know of any project that does this? 
I, I think there are, there are many such projects, uh, yeah. There seems to be someone in the audience who's organizing that. <laughs> there are two companies back here. <laughs> um, I'm Carrie Eldridge. I had a question for, uh, well, I guess I could answer their question. If you want to own, uh, I'm very opinionated on this, but if you want to own historical masterpieces of dead masters, um, the problem that I've been seeing from companies like Menseus, which has raised millions of dollars, but there's very, 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 very little liquidity. The idea of owning a master is nice, but what, what is your return? You know, how do you sell it later? So, see, the problem is, is that if they're actually a market maker, there has to actually exist a buyer in the secondary market. And what's happening right now, the companies that I've been seeing, there's no liquidity. You know, for Menseus, the if I'm not mistaken, the individual purchase price to buy a master is $5,000, yet their trading volume on Coinbase last week was $175. I don't even know how that happens. So you can share something and everyone buy it, but where's the liquidity if you don't have a buyer on the second side? And, and when it comes to Picasso and, and Da Vinci and major world masters, there's very little overall big time news speculation that happens. And even if it, Picasso sells on an auction, that doesn't necessarily affect one collection, <laughs> you know, or the piece that you have. It could affect it zero. So, you know, when you look at the life cycle of artwork and, and when it actually appraises and approves, something you really have to research. But I don't personally know any companies that are existent for old world masters that have proper liquidity that you would expect from a stock market. My question, though, was to the artist. Uh, you were saying the two problems that you're trying to solve through your platform, which I really liked. Uh, your second qu pro um, problem that you said you were addressing is the generational gap and how every two years there seems to be a new class of people uh, that are more literate, uh, so to say. And, um, oh, they're more literate, so to say. How are you actually, uh, if you can share it, how are you um, uh, approaching that using, uh, you know, it could be general as how are you approaching using blockchain or really methodically or, or how are you trying to approach that question? Um, so I wasn't saying that they were more literate. That wasn't, or that, was, that wasn't what I meant to say. What I meant to say is that we have generations of artists who have kind of, they, gr they grow up together and they make work together and it produces a work that has a, it happens in a certain milieu. And then the network changes around them. And then there are other artists making different kinds of work. And they're talking probably on different platforms as well. So that was more what I was talking about. And it's through a transparent, auditable voting system where people can see their preferences matched up against the preferences of others and just start to have a more unifying uh, a process where they can actually see themselves together more clearly and know that they've participated in a system that is fairly audited. Um, another question? Hi, uh, my name is Poisy. I'm an artist from Southeast Asia. I recently put my entire art inventory on the blockchain for authentication and provenance, exactly what you guys are talking about, and I think there are many companies doing that for <coughs> museums, galleries. So uh, one of the things that we built into my system um, allows me the first right of refusal. So um, there's a multi-signatory, and my collectors will have their artwork, well, it's physical artwork, and the digital certificates on the blockchain. And when it changes hands, I get the first right of ref refusal. Um, and yes, that help, helps me. Although there is a history why this happens, I've always had it on my um, contracts with my co collectors. And now it allows me to enforce it. Wait, do you have a question for the panel? No, I was actually, um, I felt that we... Yeah. Can I, I, th I, I think yeah. I could respond to that because it's quite interesting to tokenize physical objects because you could you could actually this is an interesting system somebody could you could refu uh, refuse that the token switches owner but the collector can say whatever I'm 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 just going to give the, this other p p person the painting anyway so like what it means for physical objects 
like metaphysical, on a metaphysical level, it's pretty unclear. Or if somebody hacks the Louvre and gets the token for the Mona Lisa, I don't think that the, the, the Louvre is going to say, okay, we have to give you the, <laughs> give you the painting now. So. I think that something else we didn't talk about, which is kind of, is, is things like resale rights, royalties. And this is, I think, one, once the infrastructure is more robust, this is, this is why I think it's possible that we could see uh, uh, an expanded market for the collection. And th what one of the things that excites me is that you could imagine it, it actually becoming more worthwhile for artists to uh, register their work on, on the kind of platform that you're talking about. Because it gives, if, if there is more uh, incentive for them to have their work circulate. I mean, I walk around this fair and it's kind of, you know, it's kind of wonderful to see all of these works. I, if, if I was wealthy, which I'm not, um, I might choose to, I might want to buy five or six of these things, but I might actually want to then change it the next eight months later. And if I knew that a percentage of the value of the work was being funneled back to the artist every time I did this, it would really change the sense of what collection was about and the relationship between collectors and art living artists. That's so funny because like as resale rights are being instituted in certain states and in certain countries, I have not seen a lot of collectors like discuss that as an incentive to collect. But it's definitely something that like blockchain like structurally affects the way we think about things and thus becomes that. But I, I think that we're going to need to see new kinds of collectors. And I'm, the, yeah, again, oh dear, the ut utopianism is grabbing <laughs> hold of me. I have, Keeps happening. I, kind of, I have a feeling that, there's, that there is this kind of potential because it can't, the, collect, the, kind of col the collection scene can't keep retreating to a smaller and smaller group of people. It needs to expand. Um, another question, but wait, there's one there. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, hi, I know several people on this panel and I really like the fact that you guys brought up the question or the um, distinction between access, accessibility and ownership. And so the question for the panel is, uh, what does it mean to own a work of art? The, is there a certain responsibility that comes with it? And especially with digital art or net art that is by definition accessible to anyone that can type in a web address or, um, uh, I don't know, see a JPEG, for example, or whatever. Um, I think that <clears throat> there is something to be said for the epistemological object of an artwork. Like, there's certain responsibility that comes with owning an artwork, especially in terms of preservation, in terms of, you know, the, this, this idea of 89 seconds that was also discussed by Eve Sussman, nobody mentioned what the actual artwork was. <laughs> Like yeah. what the actual video and was And who about. sustains it and who conserves it and who makes right. sure that it's so still works. So you're, you're distributing this to 89 or however many different people. Do these people have a sense of responsibility for this epistemological object that has historical significance or not? Matt? That's the question. I think in this case, um, uh, that's part of the question, that's part of the artwork, is will they feel that responsibility and will they show up? Like, so when we, need, when we need you to show up and lend us your little square, will you do it? And if the answer is no, then we have a sad <laughs> outcome and it's like, oh, that didn't work out, but we kind of feel like probably the answer will be yes because people are buying it because they care about it. Um, and I think in general, the answer to your question is that perhaps what, at least for digital art, which is this weird, like it, digital stuff is kind of a, a miracle. We're a little bit used to it now, but the idea that you could copy things for free an infinite number of times, that's miraculous. So, and then it had this weird um, problem where now we can't charge to only own one of them because everybody has it. So um, blockchain seems to separate that a little bit. It can be everywhere, but the ownership is separate from that and only one person has the ownership part of that. So my partner, John, has a good analogy for that. It's like you can think of the internet as a museum and in, your art is on permanent loan to the internet, but only you own it. So everybody can take a look at it, but only you can own it. So that's like one sort of analogy way to think about, about that. But it is, a, it is a little bit of a leap. Like do people feel like they own it? If they do, then all this stuff starts working. If they don't and they, own, they I want to be the only person that gets to see this, well, I'm not sure we can, we can say that that's possible. Yeah, I think it's a very interesting question because when people buy stuff and they own it, as opposed to 
like not paying for Facebook. You can just use it because it's, uh, it seems generous, but when you don't pay for something, you have no rights. And in, when people buy an edition on Left Gallery and it's software, well, software dies all the time. It's actually much harder to preserve dig digital work than physical work. Um, so we have then, well, Left Gallery has a responsibility to keep the work alive because people paid for it. And we are looking into possibilities of hosting the files, also decentralized, like IPFS or other, or that, that protocol, to keep it alive by itself, because it's dying so quickly and it needs so much maintenance. It's really a problem where, for which I don't have complete uh, solutions. So the gallery structure would also be in charge of the maintenance, like you're like providing a service to the people who own the in work? In collaboration with the artists, yeah. And part, of, and part of that solution is the sharing it with everybody, that yeah. if everyone can have a copy of the file, then we've also preserved the, the work, even though the ownership is now separate from it. Yeah, I'm just, I'm really like interested in this idea of preservation, and like I do understand like making a lot of copies helps preserve it, but like who's gonna come in and like build like the kind of environment where this work needs to be shown in like 30 years when like, you know, we're all making like beautiful screen-based work, but actually screens are gonna get tinier and tinier or whatever. Um, how much time do we have left? I like, okay. So a couple more questions. Um, who has the microphone? Uh, yeah, do you need a microphone because it's being recorded. Hi, I have one. Okay. Hey, thank you guys so much. My name is Deja Frederick. Um, I heard you earlier mention how can blockchain impact from a political climate standpoint voting? What are your thoughts on that? Please teach us. It's it's a it's it's a nightmare right now. Yeah, it's it's horrible, and in that sense, I still am optimistic that a new new technology technological inventions will be made to improve it, which mostly for the people who know about this, like moving from proof of work to proof of stake, for example, which or side chains. There's so many ways, but if this is not going to be solved, I might not continue it because it's just uh, too too bad for the environment. Yeah. What he said. <laughs> um, okay, I think you. Um. What about an artist, a controversial artist, uh, or about ownership with Modigliani, for example? How do you go about with those when there's so much controversy? Hello? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> about Modigliani, for example, an artist like Modigliani, how do you go about Because ownership is always a question mark and it's complicated. How do you go about that? I mean, that? that's one of the things we talked about provenance a lot. Like, yeah. having a blockchain register means that you know what the provenance of the object is. Yeah. I don't know the answer to that, but I'll just say that um, that's why, I, at least me and my partner, John, are mostly concerned about the digital art because I don't know what the answer is to that question. So for things that have been created on the blockchain, they start with perfect knowledge and they continue there. So every piece of the thing that we made, you know who's owned it when and for how much they sold and bought it and all that stuff. So it kind of takes care of itself from there on out. I don't know how you adapt a something that comes from the real world and is complicated. Like the blockchain is just a place to record information. So if you don't know what the information is, it's not really super helpful. Yeah, it'll just yeah. start in 2018 or whatever. Yeah. Like everything should. <laughs> um, more questions? What happened to all those people with their hands up being like, I lost my key? Um, can't see anyone. In which case? They know everything. We yeah. did it. <laughs> oh, wait, Complete one more question. In total understanding. We did um, it. Last one, I guess. Thank you. Maybe towards the end you could just talk about some other art projects that you've known about that have used cryptocurrency or blockchain in an innovative way that we would not have thought about, whether this is for ownership and, and copyright purposes or the artwork itself. Um, I feel like we haven't mentioned enough of those in the talk overall, um, and I feel like they need the recognition to be on the forefront. I, I can talk about, like... Talk about the book. <laughs> yeah, actually, yeah. So we wrote a book back in uh, September 2017. It came out called Artists Rethinking the Blockchain. And it's divided into three sections. So there's documents, which are documents of artworks that do this stuff. Uh, fictions, 
which are helping us to think about how the world, how the world of blockchain really changes politics, relationships, reputation, all those kind of things, and then theory. And one of the artworks in the book, I think, is really didactic and actually a really interesting piece of artwork. It's called Plantoid. It's a robot plant flower. So it's a sculpture that when you feed it with, when you tip it with Bitcoin or Ether, it dances and glows and uh, accumulates, it, so it accumulates money. And when it reaches a certain level, it commissions uh, an artist to make its babies. And what's interesting about this is that it isn't just, it isn't just a kind of crowdfunding object. It enables all the people who tipped it to then inform what goes into the, the instructions about the next plantoid that will be made. So you can inform certain, and, and the contract has, it sets some limitations and has some parts of it free. So you can say, so there's a charitable plantoid now. So there's about 16 of them out, out there now. One of them is charitable. So someone voted for the contract that is behind this plant to distribute a certain percentage of its money to a certain charity. So it's kind of inviting people to think about the relationship between aesthetics and governance and money. I think that's really interesting. And she talks about it as an evolutionary life form. These metaphors do not stand rigorous interrogation, but they do, they are kind of provocative, I think, in thinking about how kind of customs get passed down. Um, okay, I think if you have nothing to add, thank you so much for coming and for all of those really great questions. Thanks guys so much.